So Jesus was a talented man. I don't think anyone would question that. Healer, worker of miracles, preacher and teacher, weaver of tales, and a deeply brave man that upheld what was right far above what was easy in his 30-some years here on earth. Jews today consider him a teacher, a prophet. Muslims today consider him an ethical example of that perfectly pious Muslim. But one of the many things that I admire about our Messiah is his unique, divine confidence. It was such that it allowed him to call anyone and everyone, really, out on their bull, Pucky. We'll call it bull, Pucky. In our gospel reading today, we have a challenging an uncomfortable text. And if I wanted to stay safe theologically, I should probably preach a dry sermon about repentance and second chances, kind of focus in on Jesus' parable of the fig tree. But I think there is some fascinating bull pucky naming going on here in between the lines of this text. And I always hate to miss out on an opportunity to dig around in that for the sake of safety. So, we will dig around in an uncomfortable text. So picture this. Here we have Jesus standing outside the home of a well-known Pharisee, having an argument with a crowd of people. That we know for sure. Now, Luke doesn't tell us the name of the village, just that it's the same town that Mary and Martha lived because they were all together just earlier that day. The Pharisee, whose man Jesus is standing outside of his home, perhaps he was a leader in the local church. And when he found out that Jesus was in town with his disciples, staying with Mary and Martha, two humble ladies of no great consequence, Perhaps he quickly invited Jesus over to his home for dinner and to show him what hospitality looked like. And Jesus, as we know, never turned down a dinner invitation. He joins him along with his disciples. And it is during that dinner that Mr. Pharisee and the other guests, they noticed that Jesus never washed his hands before the meal. And while that might sound a little gross, I hardly think it's worth noting and yet, Mr. Pharisee and all of his guests are a little surprised and a little offended by that. And so Jesus pushes back at their offense. He says, you fool! You should be more worried about the cleanliness of what's on the inside, the cleanliness of your heart, the cleanliness of your mind, the cleanliness of your gut. Be focused on that rather than the cleanliness of your skin, your body. And while things sort of escalate from there, because this kind of begins a battle of wits that goes on for chapters in Luke. There's proof texts parried with wisdom, laws countered with snarky Jesus parables. This goes on for quite a while, and they eventually have to take things outside. And it's when they are outside that a crowd begins to gather around them. So many gather that Luke tells us that there was some trampling going on. People pushing in to get closer to Jesus so that they might offer an idea or a question to have him respond, just to see how he would respond to that. And he's kind of full of it. Woe to the pompous, he says. Woe to the greedy. Woe to those spiritually locked away amidst laws. Jesus answers their questions, even though he's full of woes and a bit of finger pointing that night. He tells them to unburden themselves of false expectation. He says that he isn't there to bring unity, but division. He will bring division between the hypocrites and the humble. And on and on and on he goes. And then we have our passage today. And it's really sort of the piece de resistance this evening. Someone set before Jesus the impossible question, an absolute trap. It starts like this. 
Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And what does that mean? Well, every now and again, Pilate, the Roman governor over Judea, he liked to make a statement about his authority, his power. He liked to remind the common people, the Jews, that they belonged to Rome. And so he would send out some soldiers to a synagogue where they would massacre the people as they prayed. That happened several times. Pilate mixed their blood with their sacrifices, meaning that Pilate had them killed in their place of worship. And then Jesus offers another incident. He puts it on the table. Maybe someone had just brought him the news. He says, 18 people had died when the Tower of Siloam had fallen on top of them. An infrastructure accident, right? Was there malice in this? Was there poor planning? Was this an earthquake? What brought it down, we don't know. But these incidences are laid on the table for Jesus to address, and the people ask him, why? Jesus can wax on all night about greed and pompous Pharisees, for sure, but in this battle of wits, what will Jesus do with that impossible question? Why? Why did this bad thing happen? Who's to blame, they ask. Whose sin brought this on, they wonder. This moment is similar to John 9, the healing of blind Bartimaeus, if you remember that story. The people ask, why is this man blind? Is it because of his sin or is it because of the sin of his father that he was born blind? And Jesus told them that this man's blindness has nothing to do with sin. And when Bartimaeus was asked that same question, why? He said, I don't know. All I know is I once was blind, but now I see. In Luke, the people are playing the blame game. They bring this impossible question of why do bad things happen to Jesus to answer. All evening, he had been teaching and engaged in this battle of wits, but this sort of stops it flat. In his book, In the Shelter, Finding Welcome in the Here and Now, poet and healer Patrick Otuwama, what a great name, he describes the Buddhist concept of myo, M-U, myo. If someone asks you a question that is too confining, too flat, (coughs) too small, Otuwama writes that you can answer with the word myo which means unask that question. It says unask it because there's perhaps a better question in there somewhere, a wiser question, a deeper question, a question that expands possibilities. I think if this had been an option in the day in the culture where Jesus was speaking, Jesus himself would have pushed back with a mia. Why did these terrible things happen? Why is there so much pain in the world? Why does God allow human suffering? Mia. Unask it. Because there's a better question in there somewhere. For thousands of years, the theodicy, the question of why God permits evil in this world, has taunted us, has it not? I don't think that there has ever been a theologian, there's certainly not one alive today that I know of, that could give us an answer to that theodicy that would satisfy us. And yet, I don't know a single one of us that hasn't asked that question at some point in our life. Why? Oh, how we crave an answer to make sense of the senseless, It's clear in our story from Luke that these people think that they might have an answer to that theodicy. They believe that people suffer because they are sinful. The bad things happen to bad people. And I dare say that maybe we have fallen into the temptation of believing that from time to time. 
that sort of sin karma idea is like a human default. Perhaps you remember when Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005 that there were rumblings amongst Christians saying that the un this unthinkable disaster happened because the people of New Orleans had been sinful, that they had tolerated voodoo, that they had deserved it. 2,000 people had just died. And there was a temptation to say that it was all part of God's plan, an answer to sin. I remember hearing something similar to that when the big tidal wave overtook Sri Lanka in 2004. Maybe you remember that. 30,000 people died in that incident, and people were tempted to say it was all part of God's plan. I remember reading one article that called it a culling, a culling of the sinful. Or what about when someone dies? Let's bring it closer to home. Well before their time, we know that pain. It hits the heart of the community. It hits us deep. What do we write in the card to the family, to the bereaved? God must have called him home. Trust that this is all part of God's plan. God never gives us more than we can handle. These words help us to make make us feel good in the moment that gives us something to respond with, but is any of that true? The problem with trying to answer the unanswerable is that the answer always puts us a safe distance away from all of that pain. It holds our call to be a people of empathy and solidarity, a people of compassion at bay, because we share a common lot, do we not? After the impossible is placed on the table for Jesus to answer, he looks at the people, he doesn't say moi, he says repent. Perhaps Jesus is saying in this moment, in this call to repentance, that if we ever ask a question that would allow us to keep a sanitized distance, away from mystery and the reality of pain, then that is a question not worth the asking. Yeah. When the people bring him news of Pilate in Siloam and ask why, wondering what sin they could have committed, yeah. they're asking the wrong question. It's sanitary and it's irrelevant. And so what does God give them in that moment? Jesus tells them a story, typical. He says this, there once was a landowner that had a fig tree planted in a vineyard. One day the landowner went looking for fruit on that tree and found none. Angry, he confronted the gardener. He said, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this tree, he said, and none has come. Cut it down. Why should it waste the soil? But the gardener begged him for more time. Sir, let the tree alone for one more year until I dig around it and I'll put some manure around it. And if it bears fruit next year, then great. But if not, then we'll cut it down. If someone can tell me what that parable means and why it's relevant here, I will give you a dollar. It seems like such an odd fit, does it not? What could a fruitless fig tree have to do with Pilate's heinous acts and this accident, a tower falling over? Maybe all we get when we ask God why, all we get is more questions. Are we the landowner? Apathetic and away from the actions, our hands clean from the work and the responsibility of the trees, only looking for fruit. Pronouncing judgments from afar, saying, cut it down! Closed off from potential and possibility. Are we the fig tree? Dried up, unable or unwilling to produce fruit to nourish others. Helpless and hopeless. Wondering if we can change, 
wondering if we were willing to change? Are we the gardener? Willing to get in there with our trowel and the manure, willing to give it our effort, refusing to see this as a lost cause. Do we recognize that the outcome of that really isn't in our hands? Can we, in the words of Bishop Ken Untenier, be the prophet of a future not our own? But what has any of this to do with theodicy? The wondering of why God allows evil to exist. Why? Myam. Evil things happen. The pilots of this world are predictable and awful. And the pages of history are written with their cruel acts. Accidents happen. Is blame ever really helpful? Bad things happen to bad people, just as bad things happen to good people, just as blessings happen to good people, to bad and good alike. It just is. Is there a greater story in there somewhere? It may be. Are we ever going to understand it? No. We all ask why from time to time. According to the Washington Post, since Columbine, there has been over 200 mass school shootings. And after every one of those, I asked why. After the mosque shooting in New Zealand last week, I asked why. Seeing pictures of the flooding breadbasket of our country right now, I asked why. It's been five years since the Flint water crisis started. Progress has been slow, and most of the city is still relegated, excuse me, to bottled water. Why? It has been almost nine years since that deep water horizon oil spill in the Gulf, and whenever I fill up the tank in my car, I find myself thinking about it, and I ask why. Evil things happen because of evil choices, because of accidents, because of illness. Is there a greater story in there somewhere? Maybe. Are we ever going to understand it? No. When we ask why, Jesus says, Mia. Because the why question isn't going to get us anywhere. It is not a very life-giving question. Why hasn't the fig tree produced fruit yet? Here is the spade, here is the manure, get to work. Why do the good die young? Why do terrible, painful, unfair things happen in this world? Go and weep with someone who's weeping, grieve with someone who is grieving, march with someone who is marching, fight for justice. Go and confront evil where it needs confronting. Maybe we're to be like the gardener. Someone that is patient and willing to wait and hope. Willing to work and cultivate beautiful things in the meantime. Maybe we're just called to repent. To look at the evil in our own eye and pray for God to intervene in that. I think we are meant to imagine a deeper story, to respect its mystery. We are meant to ask deep questions and fight for justice and bring about answers. Why, I ask one more time, because there are very few certainties in this life outside of the unfailing, irresistible, steadfast, chesed love of God. Amen.